my test one too. Uh, good afternoon. Welcome to our webinar of our 2021 VIAP arbitration series. I am Hang, counsel of the Vietnam International Arbitration Center. Uh, the seat of arbitration used to be unduly dismissed by the parties when negotiating the arbitration agreements, the so-called midnight clause, but that was the past. In recent years, uh, an, uh, an agreement on the seat of arbitration has become a regular component of arbitration agreements, at least in international disputes. In any case, the seat of arbitration has a major practical importance in arbitration, and it directly influenced a number of major issues uh, of an arbitration. The arbitrability, the procedural law that governs the arbitration, and the most important thing, the competent court to support to, uh, the arbitration proceedings as well as sup to su supervise the arbitration award. Because of both the significant legal and practical effects it carries, the choice of an arbitral seat requires careful consideration of the parties uh, of the future attacks to the national system where the parties choose to anchor its arbitration. Therefore, our webinars today will focus on the classic topic of arbitration, the choice of seats of arbitration for Vietnam-related disputes, sharings about arbitration practice in Vietnam and Singapore, to open a discussion with our experts who are practicing as arbitrators and lawyers or counsel of tribunals in Vietnam and many other uh, foreign jurisdictions. Our keynote speaker today is Dr. Dang Xuân Hợp, founder of Hợp Dang Chamber, one among few chambers of arbitrators in Vietnam who had seated in hundreds of arbitration cases all over the world and also be listed in many arbitrator panels of international arbitration institutions, including Vietnam International Arbitration Center, Singapore International Arbitration Center, and even permanent court of arbitration. Without further delay, I would like to give you Dr. Duncan Herb, and he will have us to, to introduce his uh, uh, distinguished panelists of today's webinar. Mr. Hub, please. Thank you. Thank you, Han. Um, a warm greetings to everybody, uh, my colleagues on the panel, as well as the, the, the participants. It's a, it's a real pleasure for me to be here um, with you. And I'd like to thank the VIAC to start with uh, for having opened such a, such a, a very interesting um, event. Um, now, in the next uh, over an hour or so, uh, I think we're going to do three things, um, I think, in the order of ascending excitement. Uh, the, the, the least exciting part will be me um, present giving a, a general uh, introduction on the concept of the seat of arbitration, which may be somewhat rather basic or, or, or theoretical, but I wanted to lay the ground uh, for the discussion that will ensue. Uh, then secondly, certainly the more interesting part, um, uh, and we joined by, by panelists, um, very illustrious panel, as you, you can see, um, and I, I, I uh, I'd like to, I think, for the moment, just introduce them, uh, so we'll, we'll, we'll get it uh, now. Um, the, I mean, I, it, it's very hard, really, for me to introduce them because they're all very experienced and, um, and knowledgeable. So I can sort of spend two hours here and still haven't finished the introduction, but let me just go through it uh, as briefly as I can. The first one is Mr. Edmund Conover. Um, 
he's a very well-known name in the arbitration circle, uh, not only in Singapore where he's based, but in lots of other places in the region and the world. Uh, I've had the pleasure of working with, uh, with Mr. Conor about Edmund um, in, in, in many, on many occasions, uh, and I see his name uh, and his strong contribution everywhere, uh, everywhere I go. Um, in particular in Vietnam and in particular with the VIAC, he's always been a very long time supporter. Uh, so we thank you, Edmund, for joining us today. Thank you for your precious time. Um, then next we have um, two uh, probably younger faces in the arbitration circle in Vietnam, but by no means less experienced or knowledgeable. Uh, we've got Ms. Ms. Ling Dao. Uh, uh, Ms. Ling is a counsel at the VIAC, and I have the pleasure of being uh, of receiving her help on some of my cases, and I was very impressed with, with, with the quality of her work. Ling was um, trained uh, in Vietnam and then trained at uh, a very prestigious institution in London, Queen Mary, uh, where arbitration study is always sort of on top of the list uh, for students. Uh, she had experience in some of the law firms in London as well as in Vietnam, and, and now she's been uh, uh, working at the VIAC and she has worked on numerous matters. Uh, so she's very uh, close to the real practice of, of arbitration um, on various matters in Vietnam and, uh, and, and other places. Um, then next we have Mr. Ming. Um, uh, Mr. Ming is a senior associate uh, at one of the largest laws in Vietnam, as you know, VLAF. Uh, specialized in dispute resolution. Um, and uh, I, again, I've had the pleasure of, 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 of working with Ming on various matters and it's always very impressive performance by him as counsel. So we're lucky to have him here today with us. Um, Ming has had experience in various arbitration matters at the VIAC, the SIAC, the IC and, and, and other institutions. Uh, before joining VLAF, he spent some time also working at the, at the VIAC. So uh, we'll uh, very familiar faces uh, around which so I'm very happy to be on, amongst friends again. So I'm sorry I couldn't do you justice, uh, uh, my, my dear panelists, but uh, I think uh, uh, hopefully you'll forgive me for being so brief in the intro. Uh, but let's let's move on with the next uh, part of the, of the proceeding. So I will now, as I said, I will start with the first part, and I, I did warn you, it is the least exciting part, uh, a bit of intro on the concept of the seat of arbitration. Assuming, I, 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 I assume, um, I think basically zero knowledge by the audience, because I, I think we have a very wide range of audience uh, participating. So I assume very little knowledge of at all. So please, please, um, I, I beg for your patience uh, if some of these uh, turn out to be, to be very tedious. But let's just go through it. So let me share my screen. Uh, I'll be speaking for the next, uh, I think 15 or so minutes, uh, hopefully not that long. Um, so hopefully you've seen my screen there. Uh, choosing the seats of arbitration, which is the topic of today's seminar. Um, I think the topic itself highlights the level of sophistication that the arbitration system in Vietnam has got to. Uh, 20 years ago, when I first joined the arbitration circle in Vietnam, we didn't have this discussion. We didn't even know what a seat was, <laughs> I think. Oh, I didn't know it at that time, 10 years ago. Um, you know, so, um, Looking back, I think we've come a very long way in terms of the level of sophistication uh, of the system in Vietnam. So something we can be proud of. And, and I'm sure all of us have uh, made a contribution to that one way or another. So I thought it was this when I thought, of, you know, first of the what oh, this is the seat, just the seat. You know, what's, you know, what's the bit about the seat? Um, so today we'll be discussing the concept of the seat of arbitration, not just a wooden seat, uh, the normal seat that you sit on every day. Uh, uh, and contrast that with some other terminology like the place, the venue, and to, to avoid confusion. Uh, and then we we'll talk about at a more practical level, the factors that the party should consider when they choose the seat. Um, and if they don't choose the seat and the tribunal will need to choose that for them, then what factors the tribunal will take into account? Um, and I, I'll speak to these from my own point of view. I'm sure my panelists will then join in to provide their own insight uh, on, on these matters. Uh, and sorry, before I forget that the, 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 after the second part, the most interesting part will be the Q&A session, whereby we'll be receiving questions from all of you and, and you'll have the chance to debate uh, in an engage with our panelists. Uh, so please get your questions ready and, and uh, send them through uh, one way or another, the chat box or the Q&A box, I'm sure you know what to do. Now, just to set the context, I think the title of the seminar was choice of the seat of arbitration for foreign related or foreign element transactions, something like that. So you need 
often you need a transaction between two parties from two different countries for this issue to come into play. I mean, it can come into play in a, a domestic setting as well, but I mean, practically speaking, uh, usually it is more prominent in the context of a international cross-border transaction like this. So where you've got two um, parties entering into a contract, one from Vietnam, one from France, uh, and they come to discuss the arbitration agreement and they'll have the choice whether Vietnam is the seat uh, because the food is nice and you know, Ha Long Bay is nice, or France is better because shopping in France is also not bad, um, you know, Shang Wilize and, and all that. Or Singapore, you know, third neutral country and easy to, you know, uh, just a three hours away, or not stating at all. At all. So we've got various choices. You know, and, and what do we do with these things? As I was saying, the the in my view at least. I mean, there are exceptions, of course, but this, this issue is not particularly relevant for this dispute between domestic parties only. Could be, you know, it could be, get more complex, but for the moment, I, mean, I, I just put that, that out. And the only caveat I have to make to that is that even in Vietnam, one needs to be aware that sometimes the choice of the city is important um, because it determines the court of relevant jurisdiction. Anyway, just, just, a, just a sign off. Let's not get that sidetracked for the moment. Right, so let's go back to the context. So the French party and the Vietnamese party negotiated the contract later to the night and we come to the midnight clause as Ms. Hung uh, called it at the beginning. Uh, and they come to discuss the arbitration clause and assume, for example, they take the, they kept the modern clause from the VIC website. They like the VIC or any other institution. And they copy this clause into the contract. Then having done that, if you look at the website of the VIAC, it'll say the parties are recommended to also specify the seat is somewhere. Sometimes when you get too tired, you forget these notes and you just copy the clause in and you move on. Uh, and so uh, don't hurry, uh, is, is, is my first tip. Uh, look carefully. There are some fine print at the end of the modern clause by the VIAC. You should put in the seat, you should put in the language, uh, you should put in the governing law of the contract and things like that. And if you don't do one, any of these things, it could lead to a lot of trouble in the future. Um, okay, so let's not, to, today is not uh, the event to talk about the language or the, or the, the governing law of the contract, but we'll talk about the first item, which is the seat. What is this? If you don't specify the seat in arbitration clause, in my view, you'll be driving blindfolded, um, which is not a very nice thing to do. Uh, and, and I will tell you, why in a minute? And if there is a dispute, you'll be, you'll be facing a lot of uncertainties and difficulties. And why is that? Right, what is this? This is a fish tank. You'll see some fish swimming happily in the, in the fish tank. And the seat is the tank and the arbitration agreement is the fish. The arbitration agreement doesn't live unless you put the agreement in a legal system. The fish is dead, well, could be dead, I think, uh, you're technically correct, uh, if you don't put the fish in a fish tank, right? So the arbitration agreement is only meaningful if you put that into a legal system, otherwise it's got no meaning. Uh, it's just, just words sitting out there in the moon or Mars or wherever, but um, you need to put in system. So that's the concept of the basic of the seat, right? Uh, and, and that system will breathe life into the clause. That system will support the clause and make it work. So it's very important for you to base the arbitration agreement on a seat, a legal system, which is what we're talking about. So it's like a fish in a fish tank. Um, sorry about the boring example and the tedious picture, but that's all I could find um, at the last minute. Now, it, so the parties could choose the seat themselves, the fish tanks, and you've got basically how many legal system in the world? I don't know, 300, whatever, 500, anything, right? You, you, you've got, the laws of Vietnam, Singapore, France, whatever you, you know, and you, you can even shop around, you can choose any fish tank to put, you know, put the fish in. Uh, and the way to do that is just say in the, in the agreement, the seat of arbitration is Singapore, Vietnam, or whatever, whatever you like. Um, and, and, and once you've done that, you've done one of the most important jobs of your life uh, in, in the contract. Because if you don't do that, you'll be driving, on your clients will be driving life out it. Um, Less ideally, sometimes the parties choose it, but inadvertently <laughs> or in, indirectly through the choice of the arbitration rules of an institution. Um, 
uh, sorry, I couldn't find an F example for the moment, I, but I, I, I managed to find an old version of the SIAC rule, is the old version, which said that if the parties don't agree, then the seat is presumed to be Singapore, unless there are exceptional, there are other circumstances pointing the other way. And it has now been removed, by the way, just to be clear. Um, but as an example of how the parties could indirectly choose the seat via the arbitration rules of the institution. If you don't do that, at the end of the day, then the tribunal has to do it. Why? Uh, and, and it's written in all of these rules of the VIC rules and the SIC rules and everywhere that, that if the, the parties don't choose the seat, the tribunal has to do so. And I remember um, when I was doing my training course in Singapore in arbitration and my, my, my award drafting course and Professor Lawrence Poole kept telling me all the time that you won't fail if you don't specify the seat in the award. If you don't do so, it's, it's all meaningless. Um, whatever you say might be wrong because you don't know where and you're, you're talking. Um, and, and, and something might be correct in Korea, and might be wrong in Vietnam or, or India or wherever. So it's, it's very important to specify the seat. Where are we at the moment? So the import, the, the fundamental importance of the seat is that it, it defies the nationality of the arbitration, where it belongs legally, legally. So the passport, the nationality that the arbitration carries is determined by the seat. And therefore, it, de it determines the procedural law that governs arbitration. So this person, this, this element, this creature, this animal now has a nationality and is determined by the seat. And it's very important for one to have a nationality. Where you are physically might be irrelevant. You know, you might be in Australia, you might be in Singapore, you might be in Vietnam, but you carry, you know, a Vietnamese passport. That's, that's the most important thing. Legally, you're a Vietnamese, wherever you are, it doesn't matter, you're on the moon or wherever. And secondly, it determines the local court that will supervise the arbitration proceeding. And importantly, it can set aside the award. So the seat in turn brings up two most important characters in the play, namely the procedural law of the arbitration and the court that supervises the proceeding. And these are fundamentally important because the outcome of an arbitration, which I'm going to be later, uh, may hinge on one of these things. Um, So the seat is the legal birthplace. We talked about this, right? Determining the nationality, nationality. But a bit of terminology, sometimes confusing, you know, for, for, for people who've just started out and students or people who are unfamiliar with the system. And oh, sometimes also the place of arbitration as well. Um, sometimes you see the word venue of the hearing. Um, venue of the hearing is the physical place where the arbitration is being conducted. You know, these days all of the, most of it's on the, on the internet. So it sort of becomes somewhat uh, irrelevant, but before uh, Mr. Cronenberg um, and I would be sitting in a in, a, in, a, in, in, in on the on the fifth floor of the VIC building, uh, uh, having an arbitration there is the, as the venue, assisted by Miss Ling as the counsel of the VIC, and probably having Mr. Ming as counsel before us. So, so the the Hanoi is the is the venue of the hearing, but the arbitration itself might be uh, might have the seat in Singapore or other other country. So we might be working in the VIC's office, but in the shadow of French law, or whatever law that the seat belongs to. Um, that's, that's, please don't get confused. And they are, that's very clear. You know, who can ever get confused? Well, you'd be surprised. And we'll, we'll go into it in, in a minute. Um, my tip here is this. this is one, again, just my personal tip, and there's no way, don't take it as a gospel or, or Bible, but to avoid confusion, I would always use seat of arbitration as the legal seat. I would not use the word place. It is used, you know, you can, but sometimes it may give rise to an argument. And if you've got a, a serious counsel like Mr. Cronenberg or Mr. Ming, they can somehow uh, get you to spend three days and going through a lot of documents and explaining why it, it, it isn't what you think it is, <laughs> for example. Um, so I, I, I would always use the word seat when I refer to the legal birthplace of the arbitration. And I would use the venue for the hearing, not the place of hearing venue of the hearings. So just stick to those two, avoid the word place. That's my view anyway, you know, others may disagree, but that's my view, just to be 100% clear. And if you really want to be clear, you can say legal seat and physical venue, you know, put it beyond down 100%. Two more words, but I may save you three days of arbitration in the future. Um, now you think, oh my God, that's so simple, Mr. Hop, you know, why are we talking about these things? We're wasting our time here in front of our we're talking about these uh, meaningless terminology. Wow, in this case, 
um, the case between a company called P and ID in Nigeria, and it's six point six billion dollar case. It's not. A, it's a serious case, right? I mean, it's, a, it's a lot of money at stake here. And in the contract, the parties, when they wrote the arbitration agreement, they said two things. Number one, they said, if there is dispute, then one party may serve the notice of arbitration under the rules of the Nigerian legislation on arbitration. That's the first thing they said. Ah, okay. Then they said, very critically, the venue of the arbitration. Not the venue of the hearing, not the seat of the arbitration, but they used the venue of the arbitration. How confusing would that be? What is this? What is this venue of the arbitration? Um, and they went to a big, a big court proceeding, a big arbitration, of course, and, 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 and the claimant won. There was an award against the respondent in Nigeria for six, for $6 billion. Um, and the Nigerian as a state uh, challenged the award in the Nigerian court, claiming that the seat of the arbitration is in Nigeria because the first part of the clause refers to leg Nigerian legislation, the law. And they argue, as you and I have been saying, the venue only refers to the physical place. And it's got nothing to do with, with, with the legal effect of, 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 the, of the seat. So Nigerian court decided to set aside the award. At the same time, the claimant went to English court. The English court said, that's not correct. We think venue of the arbitration refers to the seat. Uh, so, so there you go, right? D different courts take different views. And I will not go into the substance today as to who's right and who's wrong in, in, in my view. We don't have time for that. But the, the only point I'm trying to illustrate is please avoid these confusing technology. Just say the seat of the arbitration or the venue of the hearing, but not, not the venue of the arbitration and then the seat of the hearing or something. You know, it's just all too confusing. So let's, let's try and get that clear. Um, final thing to get out of the way, is the VIC a seat? No, the VIC, as I explained before, it's not a seat. It's just an office that we, we sit in and do our work. It is not a legal system. The VIC is not a legal system with a legal system. Um, and therefore, after you've specified the VIC or the SIC or whatever as the, as the institution, you still need to choose the seat. Please never forget, if you, you will film the exam if you film to specify the seat. The, the, the words of Professor Lawrence Boo always ring in my ear every time. Um, yeah. Right, just to give you some practical examples of the importance of this choice. I and mean, it's, 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 it's illustrate the point that I'm not just talking theories and uh, remote um, possibilities. So if the seat is in Vietnam, for example, then as an arbitrator, we must make sure that the award is issued within 30 days from the hearing date, because that's the effect of Article 61, I think, of the arbitration law of Vietnam. You know, in Singapore, there's no such time limit. I mean, we just have to do it as soon as possible, but uh, there's no such 30 day time limit. So it's very important. It's very important uh, from the tribunal's point, from everybody's point of view. Um, if the seat is in Vietnam, then the award could be set aside by the Vietnamese court, obviously. If the tribunal relied on false evidence, um, in Singapore, there's no such a, such a ground, uh, for example. If the seat is in Vietnam, properly, I think properly, I, uh, there's a lot of discussion on this, so I, I will not say with absolute certainty, but properly, the statutory limitation is two years. Uh, in the city of Singapore, it, it may be longer depending on the, on the law that governs the contract and other things. But so that, these little differences could mean a lot in a dispute. Uh, and, and it could, could either mean winning or losing, actually. Uh, so, right. So now trying to wrap it up. Um, so given such important of the seat, if you believe me, if you're convinced, uh, I hope you are, but because I leave it to you, uh, then when you discuss the contract, how, how do you choose the seat? What factors do parties look at? And again, it varies. I mean, it's very hard to say. It's like, you know, what factors do you look at when you get married? I mean, it's just everybody's got their own choices, you know? It, 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 it's very hard to, to give a generic answer. But in my experience, nobody's going to take out the two laws and compare them word by word, say, oh, is Singapore law better or Vietnamese law better? That's, that's, what, that's not what they do. Uh, basically, they take a, a more, in my view at least, in my experience, the parties take a more generic look at the system and say, which one do we trust the most in their own circumstances? Maybe sometimes based on neutrality. I'm from France, you know, from Vietnam, let's choose Singapore, easier. So no one can argue 
uh, about, about partiality. Quality, Singapore is a good country, for example. Uh, systems good, so we believe the cotton system of Singapore based on the common law. Or Vietnam's come a long way after 20 years. Vietnam's now got a very sophisticated system of law and the court and everything is all good. Whatever, right? It's a, it, 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 it's a, a judgment call for, for the parties to make. Uh, the lawyers, you know, we've got very uh, sophisticated firms uh, specializing in arbitration in Singapore, like Mr. Cronenberg's firm, for example. Uh, therefore, we go to them for advice and for services. Uh, do we have them in Vietnam? Or maybe we start at this in Vietnam as well, Mr. Ming, you know that. You know, so you can ask yourself this question and, and go through the list. Um, what about arbitrators? You know, do we have the same ones in Vietnam and Singapore or another country? We go through them. And finally, if we choose this seat, is the award render in the seat enforceable under your convention, for example? You know, so all of these, you will go through the mind of the parties. And of course, these are the lawyers. That some, a lot of the commercial parties are not interested in these things. But the lawyer will go through these things and advise the client on what to choose depending on the circumstances. There's no one size fits all. Uh, and, and different parties, different perspective that I was saying. Just one small note, that if the enforcement is in Vietnam, if you think the award is going to be enforced in Vietnam, then having a Vietnam seated arbitration may help you, won't help you avoid the recognition process for, for an arbitral award. Um, so a lot easier. But again, sometimes, oh no, I want to enforce this award you know, in Singapore because my other parties, my other party is Singaporean. And so maybe in that situation, it's better for the Vietnamese party to choose Singapore to see. So it all depends, right? Uh, yeah. Um, so I'll set, set out some of the pros and cons. I mean, there's, there's nothing, nothing uh, new here. You know, if if you choose the foreign seat, sometimes you look at the quality of the legal system, uh, quality of the award. But again, you've got the inconvenience. You know, you go to France. And, oh my God, these days you don't have to go anymore. There's a different issue. So. Uh, cost, um, um, lack of familiarity with the legal system. You need to engage foreign lawyers. These things are changing, by the way, right? There's a, uh, I was saying yesterday in a different co conference that there's a, now a revolution changing all of these things at the moment, but we'll not go to that today. So you might be saying, saying, oh my God, Mr. Hobbs, I've been talking for about 20 minutes now, but what's the bottom line? Is Vietnam, Vietnam better or Singapore better? Just give me one answer. You know, so I, I need to go home on Friday. Just tell me one sentence. Is Vietnam better or Singapore better? And sadly, uh, I can't tell you that uh, as you would, if you're a lawyer, you wouldn't know exactly why. Lawyer will, ne lawyer will never give you a, an absolute answer on anyth anything. Um, it's impossible to give you a, a generic answer, one size fits all. It all depends on the contract, the party's perception, and the relevant uh, uh, situation of the case. I just want to tell you one short story before uh, we finish up uh, soon, quickly, is that when I first started my career as an arbitrator about, I can't remember, many years ago now, I did this modern case, but the Vietnamese party was suing a Singaporean party, I remember, and based on a contract, and it was clear to me as an arbitrator that the Vietnamese party should win. Uh, it's very, very simple. So I gave, I, I gave the award for the Vietnamese party. However, the contract was signed by a deputy uh, representative of the Singaporean party, not, 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 not the official representative, you know, there's a distinction in Vietnamese law. Uh, so the Singapore party then challenged my award in the Vietnamese court and they set it aside on the basis that the contract was not valid. It was, signed, it was not signed by the big boss, only by a small boss. So you know, to me, that was most unfortunate because if that award had been read in Singapore, I'm sure it would have been enforced easily. It would have, they would have got, got the money very, very quickly. Um, so having a seat in Vietnam in, in that situation, so it quite fires against the Vietnamese party. But anyway, that's just a neither here nor there. Uh, I just wanted to tell you a story about, about that, uh, to share with you that different situations call for different choices. What about if the parties do not choose, then the tribunal will have to choose it for them because it's only when they choose, then they can start working. If we don't have the seat, we cannot start working. We don't know where we are, like driving life audit, as I told you at the start. So we often start with the rules and the rules are very different. You know, VIC rules different, SIC rules different, ICC rules different. Uh, at the VIAC, we need to choose the seat as we consider appropriate, for example. At the SIAC, the tribunal need to have regard to all of the circumstances of the case. And what are these things? I mean, again, my, my, my colleagues in, on the panel will give you more of their insight. But um, as for me, I often look at Number one, the proximity between the potential seat and the, and, and the transaction. 
So if the transactions between Singapore party and the Vietnamese party, I wouldn't go to France or, or, or somewhere too far away because it's just not relevant. Um, quality and efficient the process. You know, I wouldn't go to a country where the system is is is, is so questionable that you know uh, the award might be might be challenged. And possibility neutrality is important part two, and other relevant consideration of the case. And, and often, practically, if you give me a real case, when the moment we sit down, it's pretty clear actually. I mean, I, I haven't had a case where I had to think too much really. You, you sort of come up with the choice pretty pretty quickly. Um, so I've come I've now come to the end of my presentation. So uh, thank you for your patience and, and congratulate you on bearing with me uh, the most tedious part of the presentation of the, of the seminar. But I just wanted to emphasize once more that amongst these four important elements of an arbitration clause, the seat goes to the heart of the award. It determines the nationality of the award. And, and, and therefore, the enforceability of the award might depend on the seat and therefore it needs to be chosen carefully. So I will now leave it there. Uh, and we now, I will stop the screen share to now um, start the second part of the uh, discussion of the, of the seminar, which is the discussion with, with our panelists. And, um, I would now uh, go and ask each of the panelists on whether they have any experience or insight or comments on any of the matters that I've talked about in the presentation or any other matters on, on, this, on this issue. I think I will, I will start with our international friend, if you don't mind, um, uh, admin. And then follow by uh, by Miss Ling and eventually uh, Miss Ming, if, 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 that, if, that, if that, that that's all right. Um, so can we start with uh, with Edmund? Um, can I give the floor to you for you to share with the audience any insight that you might have on any of the issues that I've just discussed? Thank you, and over to you. I hope. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Thank um, you. Thank, uh, I, I want to thank you for uh, having me here and uh, allowing me to share uh, my, my views. And I thank VIAC as well. Um, let, let me just talk about the, the importance of a seat. And this is something that goes back to what uh, Hop you were saying. If you get the seat wrong, uh, the whole award may be set aside. And that, in fact, happened in a recent case in 2020 um, involving a, a Macau party and a Laos party who had an arbitration. And uh, uh, this case went eventually before the Singapore Court of Appeal. And the Singapore Court of Appeal decided that the tribunal uh, applied the wrong seat. And as a result of that, the award was set aside. It was as if the whole arbitration hadn't taken place, the award wasn't rendered. So the, the seat is really that fundamental. And I just would like to underscore what you had, uh, you had explained earlier. Uh, an arbitration agreement is only one um, hand, if you like, in an arbitration. You need two hands to clap. Um, and you have the arbitration agreement, but without the law that gives force to the arbitration, the arbitration agreement is nothing. And you need that law to create, in a sense, the arbitration or put the arbitration agreement into effect. And what tells you the law to apply to give force to the arbitration agreement is the choice of seat. So it all comes back to the seat. So if you, if you don't remember anything else from this webinar, please remember to put the seat in the arbitration agreement, choose a seat. Um, if the, the seat is not chosen, uh, it's quite a problem for the, for the tribunal because let's say the tribunal feels that the, the most appropriate seat is country X. And let's say it gets it wrong and later a court were to set aside the award because the tribunal gets it wrong. You don't want to risk that. And that's always a risk when the tribunal has to decide what the most appropriate seat is. So in practice, what a tribunal will often try to do is if the seat is not agreed, it will try to get the parties during the arbitration at least to agree to what the seat actually is so that later on there's no fight. If, and if they agree uh, on what the seat is, if it's Vietnam or it's Hanoi, it's Ho Chi Minh City or in Singapore, it's very hard for them to challenge um, the award later on the basis that the seat was chosen wrongly because they've agreed to the seat. Um, if, let's say, the parties don't agree, then the tribunal is stuck. It's really got to decide. And the approaches are a bit different, uh, varying from country to country. 
Um, but generally, what most tribunals, in, in my view, would do is to try and find, as you say, what is the, the seat with the closest connection to the parties, to the dispute, to the law at hand. Um, but the, the tribunal will look at the contract between the parties. Is there some different wording than the seat is whatever? Is there some other expression of what the seat is? And if there is, then the tribunal should follow that. If there really isn't, and there's nothing talking about a seat, then the tribunal would probably try to figure out what the implied seat is. If the parties were asked what the seat was, what would they say when they made the contract? What is the implied seat looking at the circumstances? And therefore, you will look at the connection between the parties and the seat and the dispute and the seat and the transaction and the seat, right? But it's still very difficult and the tribunal could get it wrong. So you don't want to really risk that. Um, I'm just going to, to end off by, by talking about what parties might consider as important factors when choosing a seat. Uh, we call these uh, uh, arbitration clauses, including the choice of seat, midnight clauses because it's five minutes to midnight, the deal's already done, parties have already decided that they want to get into a contract with one another. But the lawyers say, no, 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 you must choose a dispute resolution clause, and you need to put this in, and the party say, oh, whatever, just, just stick whatever. What's your template? Just use it. Please don't do that. Please don't do that. Look at your dispute resolution clause, your governing law clause, very, very clearly. Usually, governing law would be sorted out, but the dispute clause is truly a midnight clause. It's stuck in last minute. Don't just let that go. Don't just leave it to the corporate team to stick in have a look at what's really there. And you might want to consider the following factors in choosing a seat. First, uh, neutrality, right? You want a seat that doesn't favor this side or the other side. Second, you want a model law seat. I'm going to stick my head out and uh, my neck out and say this. You want a, a seat that applies the Uncitral model law. Why? Because there's some certainty as to how the arbitration laws uh, will be if you choose a model law seat. Or if you don't have a model law seat in mind, choose a, a seat that is model law based. I'll give you an example. Um, people talk about English arbitration all the time. England is not a model law country. It does not incorporate wholesale the Uncitral model law, but many of its principles are based on the model law. So that is an example of a model law based jurisdiction. And on this point, just remember a seat is not a country, a seat is a legal jurisdiction. So the seat could be New York, not the United States. A seat could be Hanoi, not Vietnam. A seat could be uh, Berlin in Germany, as opposed to Germany. It's dependent on the legal jurisdiction. Right, And the laws of New York, for example, could be different, from, are different, in fact, from the laws of California, which are different from the laws of Chicago, which are different from the laws of Texas. So it, if you say United States, that's not really choosing a seat. That's just choosing a country. You, you have to specify New York or Hanoi or Ho Chi Minh City, etc. Right. So first, neutrality. Second, model law. Third, New York Convention to make the award enforceable in 160 over countries, right? So first three points. Um, the, the last would be my, my three Cs. Um, courts, counsel, case law, courts. The courts of the seat are very important because you can have the best arbitration laws, you can be model law, but if your courts don't understand arbitration or don't know how to apply arbitration principles, they're just going to get it all wrong, right? They're going to set aside awards that shouldn't be set aside. They're going to enforce awards that shouldn't be enforced. And that's not really supporting arbitration. So courts are very important. The courts have to understand arbitration. Counsel. There may be a limitation on counsel in some seats. Only if you are a lawyer in that jurisdiction can you argue an arbitration seated in that jurisdiction. And you don't want to restrict your choice of counsel. Um, generally, you want the ability to choose the counsel that you are the most comfortable with. So if a seat is very restrictive in terms of counsel, 
maybe it's not so favorable. And um, choose counsel who know how the arbitration process runs. Choose counsel that are able to cross-examine, examine witnesses, put forward arguments in the most persuasive way. Is there an availability of counsel or an ability to bring counsel into that seat to do the job, right? Um, case law. Um, in a civil law country, you don't have case law, but case law uh, exists in common law countries. And case law is actually very, very important because it gives certainty as to how the courts will decide. The courts do not look at the case afresh again and again and again. They decide based on existing case law and precedents. And I'm just going to add on one last point, adaptability. And that's very important in our COVID-19 world. So if we didn't have COVID-19, I wouldn't have mentioned this, but adaptability is, is prime because if you don't, if your seat is not adaptive and doesn't, for example, allow video hearings or meetings, uh, procedural meetings to take place, let's say by telephone, um, and insists on everything being physical in a pandemic world, that's going to be really difficult. Right? So adaptability of the seat is today a very important uh, feature. So just those are just some of the things I would ask you to think about. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. That was, that was certainly most valuable. And um, you know, I, I've learned quite a bit myself as well. There are a lot of issue that one needs to bear in mind there. And I think, again, I stress that at this level of sophistication for our profession in Vietnam, we really need to think about this very seriously. It's not just a throwaway line at midnight and say, oh, let's just put this in the was nice, let's just do it. Well, yes, it was nice, but maybe in this particular case, we want something else. So it's really a thoroughly thought through choice. Uh, there are a lot of factors at play here. Thank you, Edmund, it was most helpful. Uh, yes, now, can we turn to uh, Ms. Ling to give us um, some insight from her perspective as, uh, as counsel from the VIAC on some of the experience um, on this issue? Ling, can I give the floor to you? Thank you very much. Yes, um, thank you very much. I'd like to convey my uh, special thanks to, to Dr. Herb uh, for your presentation and uh, very insightful, and also for, uh, for the notes from, uh, from uh, Mr. Cronenberg uh, earlier. Uh, I must say that I highly agree with uh, all of the points that uh, you both uh, have just made uh, in your presentation and, and, and your comments. Um, I just like I uh, would like to to make some notes um, based on my personal experience and, and, and practical notes uh, based on my experience as serving as counsel supporting tribunals um, at VX arbitration. And the first thing I'd like to mention is the neutrality that you both mentioned in your presentation. Um, of course, uh, everyone knows the the importance of the the neutrality of the seat. Um, However, apart from this, um, the party's familiarity to the chosen seat, as well as its respective legal system is also, should also be taken into account very seriously. Um, because, for example, uh, if both parties are from, from common law jurisdiction uh, and they would like to choose a very neutral uh, seat of arbitrations, but it is, a civil law jurisdiction, for example, then they are both uh, not familiar with the, with the legal system, then that may be later um, become uh, a disadvantage uh, for them to, to in the participation in, in the arbitration. Um, to take, for example, I once had a case where um, uh, there, there were the parties were from Vietnam and, uh, and France, so they're both from uh, civil law jurisdictions. However, they, uh, they chose um, a very neutral seat of arbitration, which was London, um, a, a common law jurisdiction. And, and then when it comes to arbitration, um, both parties uh, actually stuck right at the beginning stage uh, of constitution of arbitration, uh, of, uh, of the arbitral tribunal, because, because of all the differences. And, and they are not familiar with the uh, with uh, all the provisions, mandatory provisions of, of the legal system in uh, uh, in, in UK, 
Um, so later, uh, because of all those difficulties, um, as soon as they uh, both parties realized that they uh, none of them can can benefit from the neutrality of the uh, of the the chosen seat and the legal system, they switch their uh, original uh, agreement from uh, from London to um, Hanoi, Vietnam, and then so in that way they can they can both um, uh, benefit. From, from the, the actual seat of, uh, of arbitration and the associated legal system. Um, so that is the first point I'd like to make. Um, the second point also of a very uh, particular importance is the, um, the enforceability that you just, uh, you both mentioned. Um, so if it is, uh, the, uh, if it is, it is not only the, the enforcement route, uh, it, uh, of the through the New York Convention, but also the particular uh, procedures for recognition and, and enforcement in a particular country. Uh, let's say, for example, if the seat of Vietnam, uh, the seat of arbitration is determined as Vietnam, um, then uh, the and and the award is considered um, domestic uh, award, then it may be um, enforced directly. At the uh, by the enforcement authority of Vietnam, without going through any court proceedings, as opposed to uh, some other uh, jurisdiction where they require a even short um, court proceeding before the domestic award can be um, can be uh, enforced. So, if possible, if you can predict uh, the place where the enforcement enforcement might be sought then um, the, uh, the seat of arbitration is very important in, the, uh, in terms of determining the route of in, uh, direct or indirect enforcement of, of the arbitral award. Um, another point uh, that I'd like to make is the potential conflict between, uh, between the law of the seat and the institu institutional rules. Um, let's say, for example, uh, parties choose um, uh, VIA uh, as the administering arbitration institution and their rules in uh, uh, in application, but they choose uh, Singapore as the seat of arbitration. Then it might uh, comes there might be some problem in uh, in the real practice of arbitration uh, if there the, if there is conflict between um, between provisions of VIA's rules and the mandatory uh, provisions of the of the Singapore of the law of the seat, which is the Singaporean Arbitration Act. Um, uh, the, the next point is the, to, to consider is the associated expenses that uh, the parties might experience during the course of the arbitral proceedings. Um, these include uh, legal costs, travel and accommodation expenses and, and some other costs associated with uh, uh, with the, the legal uh, services that, that the parties may uh, seek. Um, so, for example, uh, it, come, it comes to the quality of the legal system and also the quality of the legal profession, the, the, the arbitration professions and uh, ancillary services that Dr. Herb mentioned earlier. So the higher the quality of the legal profession and the arbitration profession is, um, the more, uh, the higher expenses that the parties may have experienced during the course of the arbitration. So that is two sides of the point that um, parties should really, uh, should care, carefully consider during um, making their choice of, of seat of arbitration. Uh, the last uh, but not least uh, point that I would like to raise is the support from the, uh, the local court of the seat especially when it comes to the application of interim measure. Now, I'd like to emphasize that uh, the court of the seat not only plays an important role in um, recognition and, and enforcement of the arbitral award, but also during, uh, but also there's support uh, during the course of the arbitration um, proceedings, uh, especially when it comes to the application of interim measure. Now everyone knows that um, interim measure needs to to be applied um, as soon as, as, as soon as possible because it's, it's it needs to be done quickly. Um, but if it is not uh, if the if the the interim measure is not sought in the um, at the local court of the seat, 
then that uh, procedure might be delayed and the party uh, cannot benefit from that. So that's all for my point. Thank you, Rinika. That was that was very interesting. And, and there is one part of you raised, and I'd like to come back to this later and ask all the panelists on whether uh, the pandemic recently has had an impact on these matters at all. Things like the cost or council and things like that, because uh, as you know, these days you can do an arbitration uh, regardless of the seat from from your office in wherever you are. I mean, you know, so, so has that changed any of these um, considerations? So we'll go back to that. So and just hang on to that that thought uh, for the moment. Can I turn to uh, to Mr. Ming um, to uh, hear in your views on all of these things and experience uh, from the perspective of a council's experience in, in these matters in Vietnam. Uh, thank you, Minka, for yours. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Dr. Herf, and thank you, everyone, for uh, your helpful and uh, knowledgeable uh, experience that you shared before. So uh, yeah. one of the things that you have just presented, I think that is very helpful to the audience. And just I just want to share something from my knowledge as well as from my experience as a practitioner in Vietnam. And as a practitioner in Vietnam, uh, I have encountered some kind of difficulty and complications under the laws of Vietnam regarding the seal arbitration. This is, this is because when you look at the, the, the most important thing, the definition of seal arbitration under the laws of Vietnam, it actually uh, may create some confusion. Because when you look at the definition under the laws of uh, commercial arbitration in Vietnam, and it say that the it is not called the civil arbitration or place arbitration, so it used a Vietnamese term being equal to the dispute resolution location. So dispute resolution location is where the arbitral tribunal conducts the dispute resolution. So it creates an impression that the seat arbitration is the physical location or venue of the arbitration and, and not the legal system that we are uh, discussing about. And in Vietnam, the seat arbitration and the, and the venue of the hearing, as Dr. Herb and others uh, have uh, shared, are usually mistaken with each other and that may affect the arbitration process. Because, so uh, I have just uh, looked at the judgment of Vietnamese court uh, recently in 2020. And in this case, uh, under the contract, the parties agree that the place of arbitration is Haiphong, Haiphong City. Uh, and when the tribunal summoned the parties to the first hearing, the venue of the hearing was the headquarters of BIC in Hanoi. And the court of Haiphong, when uh, they received the request for setting aside the award, they determined that by summoning the parties to a hearing in Hanoi, the tribunal did not comply with the agreement of the parties on the place of arbitration, and therefore violated the law on commercial arbitration as well as the VIC rules. But luckily, because the tribunal, for some reasons, they postponed the hearing in Hanoi before, and then they reorganized another hearing in Haiphong. So the court of Haiphong stated that the violation of the tribunal was remedied, and therefore this was not a ground to set aside the, the arbitral award. But actually, if you, if you look at the judgment recently in 2020, you can see that even the Vietnamese court, sometimes they are confused between the place or, or the seat arbitration and the venue of the hearing. And that's the reason why, uh, as uh, many people say, the, the place of the seat arbitration should be clearly defined between the parties. And uh, I think that not only the practitioner, but also the, the court, but, uh, should uh, get acquainted to, to the kind of uh, common and international practice of, of this issue. And that's the, the, the first point. The second point, when you talk about the meanings or the function of the sea arbitration, and I, I agree that the two main concepts and two main uh, important meanings of the sea arbitration is, first is the procedure laws that governs arbitration proceedings. And second one is about the local courts. Um, that has a jurisdiction in some aspect related to the arbitration proceedings to get the decision on, on jurisdiction or the request to set aside arbitral work. But under the Vietnamese law, uh, the first function regarding the procedural law is unclear because you will not find any provision especially saying that the procedural laws of an arbitration case shall be the law of the civil arbitration. And that's the first difficulty that the parties um, may have under the Vietnamese law. 
and about the second function regarding the jurisdiction of the local courts of Vietnam. It's a little bit different from uh, the international practice because when determining the jurisdiction of the court, the Vietnamese law rely on two different terms. The first one is the where the tribunal settled the dispute. And the second one is where the tribunal issued the decision or renders the award. So the court where the tribunal settles the dispute shall have the power to handle requests for some kind, some, some requests like the replacement of ad hoc arbitrators. And, and I think that this is not popular, but the court where the tribunal issued the decision on jurisdiction or renders the arbitral award shall have the power to handle the challenge of the parties regarding the tribunal uh, jurisdiction or uh, to handle the request to set aside an arbitral award. So you, you, can, you can see the difference here. So it's not always like the, the civil arbitration or it's not always like that the, the tribunal will say, uh, this award is made in the civil arbitration. There, there's no kind of uh, expert rule like that. So if, uh, for example, the civil arbitration is, uh, is Vietnam, but uh, the tribunal, for some reason, uh, because the constitution of the tribunal is uh, foreign arbitrators, and then they um, made kind of an uh, award online, they, they did not meet each other. And then they say that the, this award is, for example, made in Singapore, and that will be a nightmare. And that's the second thing under the laws of Vietnam. That I think that is may, may be difficult for a foreign practitioner to understand, but that's what happened in Vietnam. And about the, uh, the, the last thing I want to discuss with you is about the factors that need to be considered when you uh, uh, choose to see arbitration. So you, you all say about uh, other factors that I uh, almost agree uh, to, and I just want to emphasize about the neutrality because uh, as the topic of this seminar is about the dispute with, uh, with relation to Vietnamese party. So I think that in this kind of uh, dispute or in this kind of contract or transaction, the parties always want something neutral and, and they want something that, did not, uh, that does not bring some kind of advantage to the other parties. So for example, in case the, the contract is between Vietnamese party, uh, Vietnamese party and, and the French parties, like as I have said before, then the, the party may not like to have a sea arbitration to be France or to be in Vietnam, but they want something neutral like Singapore. So that's kind of uh, depending not only on the, on the legal system quality, on the cost system, but mostly from the, from the first impression is about the feeling of the parties they feel that it is neutral, it's safe for them, and it's no uh, advantage to the other parties. So thank you. That's my uh, um, observation and an experience I have uh, uh, before. Thank you. Thank you, Ming. That, that, that was fascinating. Thank you for your, for your insight, because it, this, from my perspective, it highlights the importance of what we're doing here today. It is not simply a matter of a, an ad hoc discussion on um, an issue that has been debated in the literature of the last 200 years. Um, but from Vietnam's perspective, you know, we, we really need to look at this seriously because I was part of the drafting committee of the, of the law on commercial arbitration. And, and to be frank, we didn't really give too much thought to this. <laughs> just, just the way it was, I was telling you, you know, you know we, 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 we've come a long way since then. Um, and, and so, so really uh, these things now, I think need to, to be looked at again, uh, very seriously to provide a, a, a solid fundamental platform for the system and avoid this confusion um, as, as we move forward. So thank you, thank you for, for sharing those. Um, so let's now go back to, um, to our panelists and maybe I'll, again, I'll, I'll start with you, Evan, to see whether you have any comments on any of the things that, that Ling or Min have been saying. And also in, in relation to my part, which I asked earlier, is whether any of the, uh, of the, of the, of the factor that you mentioned uh, have been affected by the pandemic at all, given that these days, for example, the issue of Kausa, um, you, you, you can have with Kausa from when you don't have to go to Singapore to engage Singapore and Kausa, and you can do it from anywhere. So in, in a way, I think, if, if even, even where I've got a, a Vietnam city arbitration, but I really wanted your services because this is a, a very important matter, uh, a lot of money at stake, and I wanted to engage your firm, for example. Nothing stops me from 
I'm engaging you on a Zoom call like this, and you can represent the client from wherever you are. So the fact that it is Vietnam City doesn't prevent the parties from choosing council overseas. So is it changing at all uh, in relation to these things, Edmund? Can I hand it over to you? Thank you. Um, th- thanks, Rob. I, I think it is, actually. Um, I'm just going to tell you uh, about... Um, an actual arbitration that uh, I was involved in as counsel. Um, And it was not a a VIAC arbitration or SIAC arbitration. It was an ICC arbitration, but it was seated in Vietnam. And uh, the arbitrator who was appointed by the ICC was a French speaking uh, national, but she was based in Singapore. Um, And we had uh, all the hearings on Zoom. Um, I was sitting in Singapore and arguing my case from Singapore. Um, My good friend, Mr. Tony Nguyen, was on the other side. And and he was not even in Vietnam. He was in London. He was stuck in London. And he was arguing his case from London with the time difference. So the time difference is something I'm going to come back to. Um, The tribunal was in Singapore. uh, But again, everybody was uh, on Zoom. So we weren't in the same physical location. The witnesses, um, some of them were in uh, Hanoi, some of them were in England, but not London, outside of of London. So uh, nowadays, you know, you you can do this and you can literally choose which council you want to handle the case. But again, familiarity with the laws of the seat um, is very important because the tribunal, to a large extent, relies on council to tell the tribunal whether there are any special laws governing the issuance of awards in certain seats. And Hop, you you brought up an excellent example, which is in Vietnam, the award has to be rendered within 30 days of the final hearing. And this was something that had to be highlighted to the tribunal because, you know, uh, this this tribunal was not um, uh, 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 trained in Vietnamese law, qualified in Vietnamese law. So the tribunal was grateful to hear that okay, both parties are telling me, look, I have to issue the award within 30 days of the final hearing. Um, as long as counsel do that, and as long as you, know, you, you are mindful what laws apply to the arbitration because of your choice of seat, you can have the, the arbitration in any country, uh, uh, from any country with counsel in various countries, But of course, the seat never changes. The seat is always Vietnam in that particular case. Uh, Council can be zooming in, parties can be zooming in, witnesses can be zooming in. The time difference is a problem. The time difference is challenging, which is why we had to start at um, 3 p.m. Singapore time. And we carried on until about midnight, you know, 11 o'clock Singapore time. So it's challenging. Uh, on the parties, if it's not your usual time zone, because you know by eight o'clock you may be tired, or your witnesses may be tired, or um, uh, I think uh, Tony was was dialing in at six a.m. London time, uh, or something like this, or maybe a very early uh, on some days, and so it was challenging for him. So the time difference does make a difference. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Adam. So, so if if we now. Uh, can handle these things with Carlson from anywhere, the issue of convenience, the issue of cost, uh, may be somewhat sort of neutralized in a way. Um, so then it comes back to the two fundamental key points of the quality of the legal system and the quality of the court. And these are really the two, at the end of the day, the, the, so that in the, in the three C, I think you mentioned, you mentioned case law, Carlson and uh, Courts. Court, I think that's right. And so I think it's case law and court that that that, that remain as the prominent consideration, whereas Carlson, you can you're gonna access them from really anywhere and you get a system from local Carlson or I mean, you know, to, to help you out with the local issues, I think. Um, so that sort of again highlights the need for Vietnam to really clarify the issue that Ming was talking about. That you know, if the law itself isn't clear what the city is, then you know we <laughs> We, we, we start to have a bit of a, of a debate here. Um, so we need to, to look at that seriously. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Evan. Um, we want to, to link any, Link, do you have any other, other thoughts on, on these issues? Uh, especially as, as you mentioned, I think convenience and, and cost and things like that. From your perspective, from the VIIC, uh, it is something that, um, you know, you, 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 
you're trying to do some work on, you know, to uh, improve the attractiveness, uh, basically, of Vietnam and the VIC uh, together uh, as the seat. Thank you. Um, yes, thank you. Um, so regarding the issue of, of uh, the application of IT um, in uh, in the uh, during the arbitral proceedings, in order to to fasten the procedures as well as to 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 support the party the parties better in um, uh, during the arbitral of proceedings, uh, VIA has has been working um, hard to 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 bring the support of IT into into our procedures. And also, um, on the other hand, we um, we have some activities to to encourage and also to educate the parties of, of all the benefits uh, of having, for example, a virtual hearings and and using all the sports from the electronic um, devices and and the sports from IT. Um, however, there are some um, some concerns that the parties raised. Um, and I think it, it's 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 quite reasonable during the arbitral proceedings using the the support of uh, of all electronic devices and, and other IT support is uh, with regard to to more complex uh, arbitrations um, they might not they might concern about um, the confidentiality of using all the electronic devices as well as to have the virtual uh, hearing um, uh, and also the uh, they also can the parties also concerned about um, the efficiency of the communication uh, between the tribunal and councils of the parties during the arbitration uh, during the, the virtual hearing um, so that those are some of the concerns that the parties that some parties um, strongly raise during uh, our um, within our encouragement, within our efforts to encourage the parties to use um, electronic devices and, and IT support for virtual hearing. Um, also, uh, I think uh, regarding the point uh, uh, relating to, to uh, the expenses, the associate uh, expenses um, do, uh, with the support uh, of IT, um, of course, with the, all the online, logistical arrangement, the expenses, uh, associated expenses can be reduced um, quite enormously. Uh, but still there are uh, expenses relating to uh, engaging um, local councils who are familiar with the, or with the legal system uh, applicable uh, and, also, and the law applicable in the, arbitral, or in the arbitration. Um, for example, this this is a really big concern, especially for for uh, small and medium sized enterprises in Vietnam. Uh, they uh, usually raise a problem to us that if they if there's any solution to to switch the chosen seat uh, the chosen foreign seat to to Vietnam seat uh, because of the associated costs uh, and expenses uh, by engaging. Um, councils, foreign council, who are familiar with the legal system. Uh, so, so I, I would like to emphasize on that because, from the perspective of enterprises, those are all that matters. Expenses, mm. um, and also I'd like to come back to to uh, Ming's previous um, uh, points about uh, interpretation of the court um, regarding the two concepts of the seat of arbitration as well as uh, the hearing venue. So I yes, I have to agree that it, it can be observed from, from our experience that local courts of some cities or provinces which are not familiar with arbitration related activities may misunderstand these two concepts of the seat of arbitration and uh, the hearing venue. So consequently, uh, there might be such a risk uh, of of misunderstanding and confused between these two uh, and mixing up between these two concepts if the seat and the competing court uh, is in those uh, in one of those cities or provinces, which is why the majority of the party's choice or um, the tribunal determine, uh, determination of the seat refers to Hanoi or Ho Chi Minh City. If it has to be uh, within Vietnam, then the majority goes to Hanoi or Ho Chi Minh City. 
whose courts are familiar with the arbitration related concepts such as seats of arbitration and, and hearing venue. And uh, with that comes into play um, the, the risk of the courts, the local courts misunderstanding between uh, two concepts and which leads to, to the annulment, for example, of, of the arbitral award uh, reduces. Thank you, Lynn. That, that was most interesting. I think, it, again, to me, it highlights the importance of this particular event. Uh, hopefully, this is one of the first steps we try to make some inroads into the uh, uh, development uh, in this area in the law as well as in the court um, understanding and application of these fundamental concepts. Now, talking about the court, there is one issue that I hadn't mentioned I wanted to go back to, which is adaptability. And I think when, when, when you mentioned that term, I think you were talking about the ability of tribunals, you know, coming onto a Zoom call and the institution managing it, you know, and, and, and all that. But I think ideally the court should be on board as well. So if in an ideal world, if you have an, uh, a virtual hearing arbitration and someone challenges the particular matter, jurisdiction or whatever, then ideally the next day you have another Zoom call with the relevant judge, you know, in, in, in the jurisdiction uh, to dispose of the matter in the next few days or something, as opposed to taking another three months or six months or a year to, to, to the process. So um, I, I, I'll ask Ming, uh, because he's got experience with the court system, before I go back to, to the others, whether you see any sign in the court system of Vietnam to go along that direction. Because I, I know there's been a lot of development with the IT, like a lot of case law is now online. Uh, the court system has been doing a lot on this website and things like that. Uh, and currently with the pandemic uh, in, in, in Vietnam, and do you think there is any chance that the court system might go online with these things, these matters, at least in relation to arbitration with foreign elements like this, me? Uh, thank you for your question. Actually, uh, when I practice in Vietnam in these days, when are uh, the, the, given the situation of the COVID-19 pandemic, so in, in practice, Many courts they uh, try to reduce the number of uh, uh, physical meetings uh, between the courts and the parties. Um, it lead, it result in the fact that the the case settlement will be delayed or prolonged until the case of pandemic uh, until the situation of pandemic uh, decrease or, or is uh, mitigated. So I think that together with the development of the Vietnamese court. Uh, with the with the international practice on arbitration, for example, like uh, Miss Ling just said about the the some kind of Hanoi court or the city court, they are uh, more and more familiar with the with the arbitration in practice, and also with the uh, policy of the Vietnamese court to apply IT uh, into their work. For example, like they are trying to, I remember that there is a resolution uh, that the court trying to create a system to re receive the petition online, something like that. I think that it can be, it can be a potential uh, solution for the Vietnamese court, especially if the situation of pandemic getting worse, what we do not want. But um, I think that it can be a possible way in the future for the Vietnamese, Vietnamese court, especially for the Ho Chi Minh City and the Hanoi courts. Right. Well, we, we, certainly, we certainly hope so. Edmund, from Singapore perspective, um, do you think they'll be installing Zoom and staff and facilities in the court system, or maybe already? Uh, well, you know, um, actually, I have not done a physical court hearing um, since around April 2020. All my hearings in court have been on Zoom, just like this. And so we've had to adapt to it. The judges have had to adapt to it. The judges have had to um, learn how to use Zoom and... and um, use the technology, um, and we've had to adapt in showing the documents to the court online and everything. But Singapore courts um, have, have made the jump. And I can safely say that I think the Singapore bar is now quite comfortable in making arguments um, online like this. Of course, the, the, it's, it's a whole different kettle of fish. I don't want to get into all the technicalities. But, you know, uh, uh, again, you know, I can't be, for example, looking at my notes like this. I have to be looking here and um, I, I can tell you right now, I'm not looking at the full screen. I'm only looking at part of the screen so that it looks as if I'm looking at you in the eye. So we've had, we've had uh, to, to grapple with all of this. And, and I can tell you 
based on my experience working with Vietnamese council, you guys know how to do it as well. Mm. Very well. Mm. Thank you. And experience with other neighboring countries, um, I mean, like uh, in, in not Vietnam, but like in the Philippines or any other ah, um, country. Yeah. Okay, uh, Indonesia is, is doing arbitration hearings uh, online. Uh, the Bani uh, is doing that. Uh, Malaysia is doing it online, uh, AIAC. Um, I think NCAC in Cambodia is allowing it. I'm not sure uh, entirely. Uh, Philippines, I'm not sure. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, I think naturally, I, mean, uh, I, I don't have to be a, a naturalist to say this, but naturally every country wants to promote itself as the seat of arbitration for various, various reasons. Um, and I think in this day and age, we need to take a fresh look at, at this matter and, and Vietnam's got to decide for itself what it wants to do uh, in relation to make a make a head start and make you know to make a leap leap forward um, because certainly other countries are really moving on um, in in many ways and um, uh, it would be very hard to persuade a foreign party to accept Vietnam as a seat, for example, if they say that look, can you do a hearing online? Can you see the court online? Can you already think? And uh, uh, you know, it's, it's it's very hard to answer these questions. I think we need to taking these things um, just logistically. But I think we can do it, Edmund. Mean, you know, as you said, the local council have no issues in jumping onto Zoom. We can, we're doing these things now. I mean, there's no difficulties at, at all. Uh, but I think the whole system to, to embark on this process is a big issue, and we need to look at that. Uh, thank you. Now, to, um, that's been a lot of invaluable insight. Um, I'd like to spend just the last few minutes of this second part of the event to see if our panelists have any other things you wanted to share on this issue before we move on to, I have to say, a number of questions, burning questions that the audience have put on the, put on the Zoom uh, Q&A box. Um, but can I give you a couple of minutes, um, we can always return to this, but do you have any other thoughts, any burning issue you wanted to share on these issues before we, we move, move forward? Um, uh, now, if, if not, if not, then I, I, I will now take um, go through the questions that we've got uh, in the Q and A box, and we will take them one after another. And 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 let me know if if you're keen to answer any of these, and we'll to discuss them. Um, I think this is to me this is always the most interesting part uh, of, of, of the event. So now let's. I'm now opening the Q and A box, um, and just take the question top. I think it should go top down. I'm not sure it's bottom up. I think it should be go top down. So first question from anonymous attendee at 5.25 p.m. As far as I read the sixth edition of Redfern and Hunter, a gift I got from the IAC. Oh, wow, that's nice. I just got a gift from the IAC like this. Um, it is now encouraged that parties to agree on the city of arbitration to be a specific city of the nation. Uh, I'm wondering whether such agreement implies agreement on both seat of arbitration and location of the hearing. The interpretation of such implied agreement is of importance as in the law in the commercial arbitration of Vietnam. If parties have agreement on location of the hearing, the arbitration could not override such agreement. Is that regulation the same in other jurisdictions and other rules of arbitration? Things a ton, right. Uh, I, I so, so, so basically the question's got, I think two or three parts to it. The first part is the choice of a city as opposed to the choice of a country or a legal system as we talked about um, and, and, and what does that mean uh, and the second part is whether the choice of a city also refers also implies both seat and venue uh, using my terminology uh, or what, what, what does it imply uh, and and thirdly if the um, under Vietnamese law if the parties have agreed on uh, a particular matter like the location of the hearing and the tribunal could not override that. Is that the same as in other countries? Um, so that's, that's, let's take them, uh, it one by one. Choice of a city as opposed to choice of a country. As I was saying in my presentation, I think as far as Vietnam's concerned, um, uh, you know, you, 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 it would be nice to know in advance which court, which court you want to go to. So you choose Hanoi, for example, uh, and you put the agreement, not only in the legal system of Vietnam as a whole, but also you know that you can go to the courts of Hanoi if you have any issues, as opposed to having a fight over which court uh, would have jurisdiction. Uh, so that's my brief comment that, that I already said in the presentation. Can I just turn to our 
panelists and see whether you have any comment on this particular point. Um, going again, the same order, admin, uh, then Ling and Ling, if any. Uh, thanks, Hop. I'll just be, be brief. The, the choice of a seat should refer to a, a legal jurisdiction. If, the sit, if a legal jurisdiction is a city, then you specify the city. If the legal jurisdiction is a whole country like Singapore, you can specify Singapore. Um, the presumed location of the hearing, if it's not specified, most tribunals will probably start from the premise that it'll be in the same location as the seat. So if the seat is Singapore, they will probably say, well, you know, it, they'll presume that Singapore is the location of the hearing, but they should still ask, the tribunal should still ask the parties, um, is this the most convenient location? Are there better locations? And you can have the hearings in different locations. I mean, I had an arbitration where uh, we had part of the arbitration in Singapore, part of the arbitration hearing in uh, uh California, actually. Um, it really depends sometimes where the witnesses are. Um, so uh, there's, a, there's a sort of uh, a presumption, but you, can, you should, in fact, as the tribunal, ask the parties where they want to have the hearing. And um, can the uh, tribunal override the party's agreement? Um, the tribunal has a, a say in the entire process, obviously. But if both parties are saying, we would like to have the hearing in Hawaii, um, well, the tribunal should try to give effect to that unless he's got major problems with Hawaii. Uh, for example, he's allergic to the sun and the sea and the sand. I'm, I'm not sure. In which case he will say, well, that puts me at health risk and maybe I don't want to fly there. Or, you know, uh, he, uh, they want to have the hearings in Moscow and, you know, there are people in, in Moscow out to kill him and he doesn't want to go there. Then he should just tell the parties, you know, I'd love to give effect to your agreement, but I have a problem. Thank you. Yeah. I, I, thank, thank you. I, mean, I, I recently had a case. Um, so the, the institution asked to be handled the case and the agreement specifically says that there shall be physical hearings. I don't know why they said That's what they said in the contract. I mean, God knows why. There shall be physical hearings to take place in Ho Chi Minh City. And I have to decline because I, I, I can't do it. But, the institution was trying to convince me that, um, but in this day and age, I mean, there, it, it, there's got to be an imp implied time that if this is not physically possible, then you can do it online. But I said, ah, well, I'm not going to run that risk. If others can do it for me, then, you know, why, why, why do I face this particular risk? So I declare the case. Hopefully others in Ho Chi Minh City can sort of take, take it on and do it. But uh, if the parties have agreed, it's very hard for me. And why would I, why should I do it? Uh, it just, I don't see a, a rationale, unless there are exceptional circumstances, as Edmund was saying. Uh, Ling, do you have any comment on, on, on this question uh, before, before we move on? Uh, yes, I'd like to, to, to make it short. Um, personally, to me, uh, it does not um, such an agreement on, uh, uh, on, on a particular city uh, of a country does not necessarily imply uh, the hearing venue. Um, because obviously the parties uh, wants uh, a particular city uh, as a seat of, uh, uh, of arbitration means uh, uh, referring to, to the legal system as Mr. Cronenberg just mentioned. Uh, and especially in the, in the context of uh, Vietnamese law and, and commercial arbitration, the uh, choice of a particular city as a seat uh, of arbitration also uh, means, uh, also has the meaning of determining the, uh, the competent court supporting and supervising the arbitration as well. So I don't think it necessarily imply the hearing venue. Um, however, I have to agree with, with Mr. Cronenberg that um, the, if the tribunal uh, has the power to decide on the hearing venue, then they may take into account the party's choice of seat uh, in, in order to make uh, an appropriate decision on, on the hearing venue. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so let's, let's mean, do you have any comment on this particular uh, Question or shall we move on with the next one? Um, uh, okay, just just one more thing I want to add is that uh, maybe you maybe uh, beside the, the determination of the competent court uh, under the laws of Vietnam with regard to the seat arbitration. So there's one if uh, for other for other countries 
it may be important to determine the city registration to be a specific city because it may be a federal state, then each state has a, a specific and a separate uh, legal system and legal court. I think that may be important in some uh, kind of nation. Yeah, yeah, certainly. Uh, also, I mean, I, I took a look at this case last night, the, the case that I showed you in the slides, PNID and Nigeria, and, and the parties chose London, I think, to be the venue of the arbitration. And the English court said, why would they go to London? There's no convenient, it's not convenient. It's not a, something like, you know, there, there, there's no practical justification for using London as the venue. Uh, and therefore, there must mean it to be the legal place as opposed to the physical place. To hear this. Well, that's why I wrong. I don't know, but that, that's what they said. Um, so, um, so it, 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 again, I think it's just if you refer to a city, and, and that's fine too. But always remember to be very clear on what what you're saying. Is it the seat, the legal seat, or is it the venue for the for the hearing? Um, be be very clear. Um, let's move on to the next question uh, from Ming Do. 531. And the question is basically that, yes, we've been talking a lot about this distinction between place of arbitration and venue of hearing, but in practice, it is really important because in his experience, he had a case in far in Hanoi and the tribunal decided Hanoi was the seat and then have a case in which we sit here and the tribunal decided it was the seat. So it sort of follows each other. And, and, and to him, it was, uh, wasn't too much of a distinction between the two at all. Um, is that so? Um, um, and and I would like to comment on this. Maybe starting with with Edmund again. Do you, in, in your experience, is it is it common that these two things are actually the same, and therefore there's no distinction, or are they actually different? Oh, I think I think in Vietnam there's a peculiarity, and you know I might not be the best person to comment on this. I think uh, um, Mr. Min or Miss Lin uh, would be better placed. What I will say for our international audiences in Vietnam, you have to be very careful about where you file and what you regard as the, the seat, because it's their are specific laws. Yeah, yeah, thank, thank you, thank you. I mean, it's just, just, just to add to that, I think, um, just because in your two cases that the tribunal have decided that the seat is the same as the place of filing, doesn't necessarily mean that the next case you'll have the same decision. Uh, it all depends on the particular circumstances. So, Legally speaking, they are different things, and, and they are, as we've been talking about, about it for the whole seminar. And therefore, um, uh, they, they could be different. And I think, again, in this age, with virtual hearing everything, you know, they, they are going to be really distinct uh, because there's no, there's no more physical place. It's all here on Zoom. So you need a, a legal seat as opposed to um, the, the physical hearing place. Um, Ling, or Ming, Ling, did you have any comment on this question? Um, um, yes, I think uh, comes to, to uh, the question of, um, of the audience that is there anything by law to to draw the distinction. I think it, it is a little bit hard to um, to draw a distinction by a default provision in the Vietnamese law uh, on commercial arbitration because although there is uh, a definition by uh, a definition of, of the place of arbitration, as Mr. Ming said earlier, it's, it's not totally about the seat. It's, it's not the term here, uh, but there is a definition of, of, let's say, seat or place of arbitration. However, there's no definition of hearing venue. Um, the only um, the only provision that I can draw your attention uh, to is um, Article uh, Three, Paragraph Eight of, of the Law on Commercial Arbitration, which says. If a place of arbitration is Vietnam, the award is considered to be rendered in Vietnam, regardless of the hearing venue. So, I mean, maybe uh, by virtue of this uh, provision, you can see the difference between, between place of arbitration and, and the hearing venue. Uh, also, I think apart from a default provision of law, there's another uh, way to, to draw the distinction um, uh, between these two concepts based on the implication and other considerations uh, thereof. Uh, for example, regarding the seat of arbitration, it refers to the, the legal system, the procedural laws, court system and enforcement route, uh, whereas the hearing venue has other considerations such as the, the convenience for members of tribunal, for parties and other participants of, of the arbitral proceedings, as well as associated expenses. 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lee. Um, Ming, do you have any comment on this before we move on? Uh, okay. So for this type of question, I think that in case the parties have no agreement on the place or the venue of arbitration, okay, they are, they are different. But in case the parties do not have any kind of agreement, then the tribunal will have to determine which uh, or which one is uh, which location or which city or, or place or venue is appropriate. So you do not have you do not give us the full context of your cases. But when you say that um, the first case you uh, find the the, the case in Hanoi and the another case you find in Hermin City, I think that just my guessing. I think that there's some kind of connection between HK to the venue of the hearing or the, or the place of situation. So for example, in the first case, uh, both parties are in Hanoi or in the second case, uh, the, the, the project office or the, um, the place where the contract is performed in Ho Chi Minh City, something like that. And, the, and maybe the tribunals, they based on the context of the case, to decide the, the, the place and venue of the first uh, arbitration is in Hanoi and, and for the uh, second one is Hanoi City, but just my guessing on that. But uh, I can confirm with you that they are still a uh, separate issue and definition under the laws of Vietnam for these kind of uh, terms. Thank you, thank you, Min. Um, let's move on to the next question about enforcement of for, of, of decisions of basically interim relief, I think is what uh, this question is mainly about. Um, uh, and under some draft regulation in, by Vietnamese Supreme Court, this will not be enforced and they already enforce final substantive awards. Uh, so if they use the SIC and they come back with a foreign, foreign award, assuming the city is, is in Singapore, um, then uh, that's gonna be a problem. Um, is, is, is the Vietnamese court going to deny uh, enforcement of interim uh, decisions, interim relief order by the tribunal in Singapore, at the SIC, having a seat in the SIC? Because this has got to do with uh, enforcement in the Vietnamese court uh, context. Can I um, go back to Ming, because you have experience in the, in the Vietnamese court system, to see whether you have any insight to this? Because my understanding, and, and I'm happy to be corrected, uh, is that so far the Vietnamese courts didn't take a rather, in my view, uh, strict view of the concept of a word. And it's got to be a final a word. Um, and that's partly because also I think that the, the law on arbitration of Vietnam defies a word as a final a word. Um, so if, if you watch something that's not final and the courts say, oh, it's nothing to do with me. Uh, I don't know what this is. Um, please, please go away. Um, is that true? True. Uh, have you had experience at all of trying to enforce an interim decision like that from overseas in a Vietnamese court and whether you've been successful, if at all? Me? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, okay, this is uh, a difficult question. Uh, That's why I asked so you, Ming. Yeah, I think, that <laughs> I think that there are two issues with, with this question. The first one is, as you say, uh, whether the Vietnamese court and the Vietnamese law uh, allows for the recognition and enforcement of uh, an interim measure, which is normally is not a final award. And the answer is no. Uh, under the Vietnamese law, only the final award can be uh, kind of uh, recognized and enforced in Vietnam. Mm. But for the interim measure, there is another aspect of this question, I think. Uh, it's like the, whether the Vietnamese court has the uh, power or jurisdiction to support an arbitration, an SSAC arbitration uh, with regard to some interim measure in Vietnam. Because for example, uh, uh, as a principle, the court who will have the power to, to uh, handle the request for interim measure will be the court where the asset or the interim measure is being applied for. So for example, in, this is a, a dispute between a Vietnamese party and a Singaporean party. And uh, the Singaporean party uh, administered by AIC and then the, the, the Singaporean parties want to apply for the interim measure of a building or a, a land of the Vietnamese party in Vietnam. So whether they can do it, they can find the interim measure to the Vietnamese court. And the answer is 
uncertain. Uh, because under the Vietnamese law, there's no kind of uh, express provision that requires the, the, the Vietnamese court to support the SIC arbitration in such case. And as far as I remember, uh, I'm, I'm looking it online, but there is, uh, there is a kind of a handbook on arbitration and, and um, negotiation, reconciliation uh, issue by the Supreme Court of Vietnam and the World Bank Group in 2000 and, um, let me check, 2020, I believe 2017. In this kind of uh, handbook, you can find some kind of implication that the Vietnamese court may only support the arbitration, which take place in Vietnam. So I'm, I'm, uh, I'm not sure whether it is uh, uh, totally correct, but as far as I remember, there's some kind of implication under this handbook about that. So uh, I, have, I have some case, like I described to you before, between the, for example, Singaporean party and Vietnamese party, and the Singaporean party want to apply for the interim measure in Vietnam, and it was not successful. So just what I can share with you. Mm. Uh, thank you. Uh, um, thank you, I mean, that, that was most helpful. Uh, can I ask Ling a quick question in your experience at the VIAC? Because this question, the final part of this question says, may I choose the VIAC to remedy the situation and still keeping the seat at Singapore? Right? In your experience, has there ever been a case of the VIAC with the seat in Singapore? And in that case, did the party why for interim relief from the tribunal? And if so, uh, did they try to enforce that? Or, or, or do you have any of the experience or not at all? Um, mm. Just curious to know. Yes. So to answer directly to, to, the, uh, to the audience question, um, I must say that the, the, the solution of sweeping uh, the choice of arbitration institution from SIAC to VIAC does not resolve the, the problem at hand because uh, this concerns the seats of arbitration, which determines the legal system in the court system that provides supports and supervision over the arbitral proceedings, and not the uh, not to concern the arbitra uh, arbitration institution like whoever it is, whether uh, it is VIA or, or CIA. So I, I think that uh, that is not the solution. Um, what I think the, the the parties may consider is. Uh, when when they have the seat of arbitration um, in Singapore is that uh, from from the seat uh, from Singapore as a seat of arbitration you can uh, determine that the Singaporean court is the court is the competent court over uh, over the the arbitral proceedings um, uh, and therefore they are the compete they are competent in dealing with uh, with the um, request for application of uh, interim measure. Uh, and once a decision on, on application of interim measure is issued uh, and they have problem in enforcing it, there, there might be, I'm, I'm not sure I need to check about it, but there might be some sort of, um, you know, cooperation or collaboration um, uh, in, in this regard between, uh, between the legal legal system legal system and legal court uh, and, and national court of Singapore and Vietnamese national court uh, in order to support uh, in in enforcement of such kind of uh, interim measure so I think that might be uh, one solution that the parties can can consider and this is why I um, emphasize what I have said earlier at the beginning of, uh, of, of my presentation uh, is to, if, if you can uh, sort of uh, foresee, somehow foresee or predict um, the place where you need to sort enforcement of arbitral awards or application of interim measure, then you should choose that as the seat of arbitration in order to, to enable your um, your wish. Thank you. Thank you, Ling. Um, now, we, we the, thank you, our audience, for a lot of these interesting questions. We have, do have a number of them to get through for the next 30 or so minutes. So let's try and move on a little bit. And, and can I ask our panelists to indicate in the QA box if you would like to answer any particular question? I'll turn to you directly to save the time if possible. 
And so just to follow example of Mr. Cronwell, who just indicated that I'd like to answer the next question in relation to confidentiality, non-disclosure agreement. The question is from Fung Nguyen, who said, the, basically the question is that um, some of the jurisdiction um, don't have the duty of confidentiality in the arbitration laws, and if so, uh, he would like to have um, uh, non-disclosure agreement amongst the tribunal members and the parties uh, if he's, he prefers to have the arbitration in those jurisdictions. Can I hear from you, um, Edmund? Thank you. Um, thanks, Hop. I, I think that this is one clear example of considerations you should take into account before choosing a seat. Um, in Singapore, arbitration is confidential. I believe in certain other jurisdictions. I think also in Vietnam, it's, it is confidential. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, but if you, for example, think that uh, French arbitration is not con confidential, then that is a negative point against French arbitration, especially if you want to keep your dispute from getting to the press or, or if it deals with some business secrets. Um, all right. So let's say you don't have a confidential arbitration. What can you do? You can still ask whether the tribunal would make an order that the parties uh, would keep the the. the uh, proceedings confidential and all the documents confidential and uh, then it's up to the tribunal whether he can make the order whether he'd probably ask do I have a power to do that under the law of the seat um, even if it's not a default position do I have the power to do that and if I have the power to do that should I do that uh, to promote um, the party's interest in this particular case um, so if the tribunal agrees to do that um, then it's a question of whether you can enforce that and then that comes back to whether the courts uh, will enforce such an order made by the tribunal. Um, so again, a lot of things just fall back onto the choice of seat. The moral of the story is choose your seat carefully. Thank you. Thank you, Evelyn. That's uh, certainly a very important point to bear in mind. Um, now, I think someone is, has raised their hand to ask a question live, and I think it would be nice to hear from a, a member of the audience. Can I ask the VIC Secretariat to um, allow this particular participant to turn on the mic and speak to us directly? Thank you, Ms. Khan. Hello. Um, good afternoon to the panel. Uh, can you hear me clearly? Yes, we can. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, my name is the way I had a question regarding the CEDA arbitration in uh, online arbitration. Um, as you may know, the ODR in international arbitration have been made visible under the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. So uh, in case the party have just to determine the seat of arbitration in the arbitration agreement uh, and the party bring the dispute before VIAC or SIAC and the dispute therefore will be resolved in a virtual or online, online manual, uh, manner entirely. Uh, I emphasize entirely. So uh, in this case, uh, what approach do we have to determine the seat of arbitration? Will the uh, applicable law uh, to shut up? Uh, will the law applicable to shut online arbitration proceeding? So uh, shall determine the seat of arbitration. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Um, I think from from my perspective, um, whether you have the hearing online or or, or in real life. Um, has no relevance on the choice of the seat as we've been talking about uh, so far. So if, again, if you don't specify the seat uh, in the agreement, then the tribunal will have to do it. Uh, and based on the factor that we, we talked about earlier, uh, but it is always advisable for the parties to choose the seat in advance, whether Vietnam or Singapore or elsewhere, uh, so that when we come to conduct the proceeding online, uh, we won't do so online, but in the shadow of that particular system governing the proceeding as a matter of procedure. Um, does any of the panelists have any comment, further comment on that particular question? No, I, I agree with you, 100%. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Uh, I assume nothing from uh, Ms. Ling and Mr. Ming, in which case we'll move on uh, with the next question in the Q&A box, and I will the next question um, is a peculiar aspect of, of Vietnamese law, which is somewhat close to my heart, so I'll answer it, and then others feel free to chip in if, if, if you wish. Um, 
an arbitrary award issued by a tribunal of VIC using Vietnamese law as the law of the seat, as, is it a domestic or a foreign one? Uh, as I can see, it's a domestic award under Vietnam arbitration law, but a foreign one under New York Convention. Um, I think, I think there's a bit of a, I, I think it's a bit of an error in, I don't know, but I presume in the, in the question, and the question I think was meant to ask that if an award issued by a tribunal of say, for example, the SIAC, but seated in Vietnam, or the ICC seated in Vietnam, so there's probably the foreign element. Because if, if you simply have an arbitration of the VIIC applying Vietnamese law in Vietnam, it's unlikely there's going to be an issue about the seat. It's pretty clear, uh, barring exceptional circumstances, that the, Vietnam is the seat. But when you've got a foreign seated arbitration, um, oh, sorry, a, a Vietnamese seated arbitration, but administered by a foreign institution like the SIAC, then the question whether it's domestic or foreign. Uh, so that particular example that that Mr. Cronwell was talking about, that he was in a ICC arbitration, but having the seat in Vietnam conducted online. So when the award comes out, is that a domestic award or a foreign award for the purposes of Vietnamese law and enforcement? Um, and my short answer is that my personal view, and I've got a very strong view on this, is that under both the um, Vietnamese law and the, and, the, and the New York Convention, it is a domestic award because it's seated in Vietnam. Uh, but others disagree, and Vietnamese court may disagree, and so there's a bit of we're in a bit of an uncertain situation, um, and there's not much further I can say on this. I think uh, apart from expressing my own personal view, I think things will change soon. Uh, is my prediction. Um, can we move on to the next question? Um, based on there's one. Question about the New York Convention. I somehow don't see it here, but anyway, let's let's move on. Um, I'm an in-house from Phuong Anh. I'm an in-house lawyer of a big manufacturers in Vietnam. To be honest, I'm not familiar with other Vietnam or Singapore arbitration in practice. Needless to say, Singapore arbitration is at its advanced development, and many foreign laws arbitration are more efficient than Vietnamese law. However, when in Rome, do as Romans do. I do understand there are advantages and disadvantages of selecting the procedural law to be Vietnamese or Singapore law. Therefore, oh, this is very interesting. I'm thinking of the possibility that there could be some kind of alliance or joint venture uh, of the VIC and the SIC. So parties can, and administration could have both, the best of both worlds. So can we have somehow a joint um, seat of both Vietnamese and, uh, and Singapore? This is uh, certainly a very creative, and I, I like this creativity. Um, uh, Evelyn, can I turn to you to see if you have any comment? Have, have you seen, I think you might have seen examples of this sort of thing, a uh, combined choice of Vietnam and Singapore as a matter of other governing law or the seat? Okay, Thank well, uh, I, thanks, Bob. I, I think it's an interesting idea, but I think it's also quite problematic. Um, mm -hmm. Again, VIAC doesn't necessarily mean a Vietnam seat. SIAC doesn't necessarily mean a Singapore seat. You could have a Vietnam seated arbitration uh, governed by the SIAC rules. Uh, so uh, each institution will come up with their own rules to suit their particular circumstances. But I think what would be a little bit more interesting is whether the two jurisdictions, Singapore and Vietnam, the legal systems, could work together to support one another. So if you had, for example, a VIC arbitration seated in Singapore and the tribunal makes a, 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 some sort of conservatory or protective measure, you know, uh, to let's say uh, order security or something like that, or to make an injunction, that order can then be taken to the Vietnamese courts for it to enforce, to support the VIC arbitration that's happening in Singapore, uh, as Singapore uh, with, the, with Singapore as the seat. I think that will be really, really interesting. And that requires not a discussion between VIAC and SIAC. That's a discussion between the Singapore courts and the Vietnamese courts. And I think if you can get the discussion going, not only between Singapore and Vietnam, but Singapore, Vietnam, Indonesia, Thailand, um, everyone in ASEAN, because you know we're all in this part of the world, we should all help one another. If we could get that discussion going, it would be simply excellent. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Evan. Uh, um, 
I think we should just move on. My, my very quick comment on that is that uh, from my, my personal tip, from pending those discussions taking, taking place as Edwin was contemplating, I think at the moment it's much safer to choose one particular seat. The moment you mix the two, you're going to have a bit of a problem. Um, it's like marrying two women or two men at the same time. You want a bit of a problem. Uh, so you've got, to be, you've got to be very careful. Uh, just choose one. One is enough for the moment. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> that's, that's, that's uh, Mr. Hong, yeah. may I make, may I make a, a very short? Oh, yes, yes, of course. Of course. Um, uh, I have to say that I, I totally agree with what has been said by, uh, uh, by uh, Mr. Cronenberg. Um, it, it's very difficult to take advantage uh, of both seats of arbitration, especially because both uh, con two country and their legal system are separate and unique. Uh, so not to mention, it's, it's quite impossible to take advantage of both seats of arbitration. Um, however, apart from what uh, what has say, uh, been said by, by Mr. Cronenberg, um, uh, VIAC, for your information, VIAC and SIAC uh, has been uh, engaging each other in many of the joint activities uh, in order to provide more insights into arbitration-related issues in both countries. Um, so as to, to better prepare our users for their arbitral proceedings um, so that they, they'll be ready if, if they have to sometimes go to arbitration. Um, and also a solution to your question is to, to carefully study the specific features of your transactions and potential disputes uh, that might arise during the course of, of your transaction, as well as to take into account all the other elements relevant factors, uh, as previously mentioned by, by our speakers. Thank you, Lee. Uh, agree, agree entirely. Um, moving to the next question, I'd like to turn to Ming for this question, because again, it, it, it concerns Vietnamese courts and, and judges. And again, it maybe it goes back to some of the issues that Ming was talking about earlier. It says, Vietnamese judges may find it difficult to separate the physical hearing venue and the, and the place uh, the legal seat, because in their mind, it's just the place of dispute resolution. There's only one thing. Uh, it, it's not, not two separate things. Um, and, and therefore, if, if you separate these two, Vietnamese courts may even set aside the award uh, on that basis. Um, that would be very sad, in my view. Um, that would go against everything that we've been saying so far. But what about reality? Ming, can I ask you to comment on this, in particular in relation to the high form case? Thank you. Um, yes, so I think that theoretically speaking, we can, we can, and, and in practice, we have seen some case and some comments from the practitioner that uh, it may be confusing and it may be difficult for the Vietnamese court to uh, differentiate between the place of arbitration and the venue of the hearing. But just like Ms. Ling has said before, it's not happened like a uh, quite popular these days, especially in case of the uh, modern and advanced um, courts like in Hanoi and Ho Chi Minh City, or even in, I think, in Dana or some uh, other courts. So in case you have to, in case you have to convince the, the courts that uh, they are two different issues, I think that we should try to make it as clear as possible um, with reference to the decision of uh, other courts, like the Hanoi court or the or the Housing City courts, for for these courts to see that they are a, they are kind of the separate issue. And if you can find some kind of cases from the higher level courts, like the the High Court or even the Supreme uh, Court, maybe I think that it, it can be difficult for you to find to find them. But if you can find find them, they can be kind of the reliable reliable shots for the court to, to, to be convinced by your opinion. Thank you. Uh, thank, th thank you, Ming. Also, in relation to some of the questions on the um, Q&A box, please send uh, May I have a short comment on, on, on the previous question, please? Sure, um, sure, sure, go ahead. Yes, I, I really want to, to speak this out because uh, the question May create a impression of uh, may create a quite dawn uh, impression on uh, on on the seat uh, of the choice of seats in Vietnam um, because of the because of the the potential risk of annulment of an, of the final award if the court uh, misunderstand or, or confuse between the two very basic concepts. 
Um, so I have to say that uh, because because we are a very young jurisdiction in arbitration, and it's, it, it's, it is still developing. Um, and in, in the course of that, VIAC has been continuously um, working closely with, uh, with the court system, uh, with, with the, all the local courts, in order to, uh, to ensure that uh, they uh, understand uh, to, to the best of their knowledge, understand um, most of the basic concepts uh, and, and not to misunderstand or confuse when considering uh, or review the, the actual award. So we are still keeping that kind of uh, cooperation and collaboration channel in order to, to support and um, make it to, and, and brighten the, the future of arbitration in Vietnam to make it less done. Thank you, Lee, for saying that. I agree entirely. I think the fact that we're here today discussing these things is one of the important steps in, in helping the whole community um, to make to make progress in this matter, and um, I, I have very strong confidence in the in the system uh, taking steps forward uh, in relation to this issue. And so, for the moment, I think if contracting parties specify clearly in the contract that we'd like the city to be Hanoi, but for convenience, um, we wanted the hearing to be in in Haiphong for convenience, or whatever. I mean, I, I see no reason why the court shouldn't shouldn't respect that. If they understand clearly what they're trying to say. It's only when you don't say things clearly, that's when the court says, what did you say? You know, this is what I think you said. And that's when you were. Um, yes, that's, that's, that's why we all always educate the parties that express agreement on, on seat and also uh, hearing venue is, if possible, is always the best scenario. That's right, thank you. The next interesting question, and let's just deal with this one and then we'll move on. Um, would one day, it was a question from Sun Tung Farm, it's very interesting that he says, on the basis of the delocalization theory, would you think that one day the seat would be abolished and the seat would evolve into something international or supranational? Uh, I think this concept was raised by Mr. Pung, Jan Pongson 20, 30, 25 years ago, whatever. And uh, in my view, I think it's, since then it's been dead. Um, you can't be driving without a traffic law. How would you drive without a traffic law? Uh, uh, you know, hanging over you. You, you, you have to know what to do. Uh, um, so anyway, that's that that that's my, my view. Uh, it will not go away. Actually, it's here to stay, um, and based on the current legal like legal framework. Uh, but I'd be interested to see if uh, other panelists disagree with me um, about this issue. Will our with this concept go away at some point? Uh, the of arbitration in your in your in the foreseeable future, in your view, Edmund, you think? No, I don't think so. Um, I, I, you know, I agree with you. I mean, as I said, um, the arbitration agreement is nothing without the law that gives it force. So um, you need to know what the law is. The law is influenced by the seat or determined by the seat. If you don't have a seat, you don't have a law. And if you don't have a law, then the arbitration agreement is written in water. Um, the uh, and, and by the same token, I'm just going to try and, and just jump on a, a, another question at the same time. If the courts at the seat set aside an award, uh, they're, they're effectively saying it never took place. And so the law withdraws its support for the award and the arbitration. And therefore, the arbitration is a nullity because the law uh, withdraws support for that arbitration and the arbitration award. Um, so it, it all goes together. You need the seat uh, because it tells you what law gives force to the arbitration agreement. Agree, agree entirely. Agree entirely. I think we we we're all lawyers here, and we nothing makes sense without a law. Um, you can just just like watch some paper. If the law to give effect to it, uh, I agree. Well, I've got you there on the uh, with, with the mic on. Uh, can I ask you to deal with? I think the next question that you've indicated that you. Oh, there's a question here uh, addressed to Miss Ling, but you've said that you wanted to deal with it. So let's turn to you first. Yeah. Conflict okay. between VAC rules and the mandatory provisions in Singaporean law. Um, how would that be dealt with? Yeah, I, I thought I'd deal with it because it dealt with mandatory uh, provisions mm -hmm. of Singapore law. Um, Singapore is a model law country. So a lot of the provisions in Singapore are not mandatory in the sense that um, the party, there is a default position, but the parties can agree otherwise. Uh, so if the parties can agree otherwise, you listen to the rules to tell you what the parties have agreed either under the rules or if the rules don't say it, then what have they actually agreed in the arbitration? Um, 
But if it's a mandatory provision of Singapore law, for example, uh, the arbitration agreement must be in writing. Um, no rule can say, oh, it doesn't have to be in writing. So whether it's VIAC rules or SIAC rules or ICC rules, if the Singapore law says an, an arbitration agreement has to be in writing, no rule can undo that and can contest that. Mm. And therefore, uh, you have to give effect to the, the Singapore law, regardless of what the, the rules say. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Again, while I've got you, there's an, another question for you uh, from Tim Fan asking you about the effectiveness of Singaporean courts operating online. Um, how is that compared to offline and what's the biggest challenge? Um, what I can say is, for, uh, in my experience, highly effective. Um, and not because I'm a Singaporean, but, you know, we, we are able to make our arguments. We're able to, to address the judges. Um, we save a lot of time traveling to the court. Uh, we can do this from our offices or from home. Um, the biggest challenge, document, um, showing documents to the court to ensure that the court is on the same page. So we have to use to technology to ensure that the court is looking at the same page, the most basic of which would be to share the screen. But that's difficult because then we control what the court can see and what the court can't see. Sometimes it's not really fair because you miss out the next paragraph and, and things like that. Um, we are, as a matter of fact, the Law Society of Singapore is working out something to make that a bit better. Uh, and the Academy of Law as well in Singapore. So that's the biggest challenge, showing documents and uh, to the court and to witnesses. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Rajin. Uh, any other comments from, from, from Ling or Ling in relation to for the previous question before we move on? Um, um, no, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Um, I think in the, in the Q&A buff that I couple of comments from Tuan Nguyen, but I think I just agree with that because that's just comments. So thank you for your comments, uh, Mr. Tuan Nguyen, the most helpful. Um, so there's next question from Zoom Nguyen. Can you summarize your opinion to avoid possible confusion to the audience? Does the choice of seat mean selection of supervisory court, procedural arbitration procedure, or mandatory rules only, and governing law of arbitration agreement under your convention? And place of the hearing or all. Um, okay, let's let let's. Let, 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 thank you for the question. That was I think most helpful. But that enables us to summarize everything we've said so far. And that, let me have a have a go at this. And 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 I'm sure my fellow speaker will tell me if I've got it wrong. And we're going to comment on it. So the choice of seat certainly means supervisory court, which right so far. So the court of Singapore will supervise the the, the proceeding if you've chosen Singapore as a seat. The same goes for procedural arbitration procedure. Uh, well, mandatory rules only, I, I, I wouldn't think so. The, the, the procedural law applies as a whole uh, and the mandatory rules are the rules that you cannot opt out of. So the mandatory rules certainly apply, no question about that. But in relation to the non-mandatory rules, you've got the option to depart from it if you wish to, but the whole law still applies as a whole. Um, uh, governing law of arbitration agreement. Uh, I think this is more problematic and, and, and I think requires a separate seminar. I, I'm not quite up to date uh, on this issue, given the recent decision of the English court, but maybe Evan can, can have some insight into this. But my view is not necessarily. There's been, been a lot of debate on this, this issue. So that's a bit separate from what we've been discussing so far. Uh, uh, and, and on one view, um, it is not uh, the same uh, as the law of the seat. It, it may be the law that governs the entire agreement. Um, finally, place for the hearing or all. No, the choice of the seat does not mean the place of the hearing. Um, these days all online as you know now. So that question is somewhat sort of moot because you can, you can choose to have the hearing wherever is most convenient unless the party requires something specific. Um, so that's how I've gone through it to break it back a bit. Let's see if my co-speaker have any comments on what I've said so far. I've got it somewhere terribly wrong. Um, Anyone? Oh, can I just jump in on the governing law of the please, arbitration? Please. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Please. <laughs> so, so let me just try uh, and, and make this very, very simple. Uh, I'll try. All right. Uh, no guarantees. Uh, you have a contract. The gov the, in the contract, there's a governing law clause. So that governs the terms in the contract. The arbitration clause in the contract is regarded as a separate agreement from the, the rest of the contract. That's what we call the doctrine of separability. 
because it's a separate contract, it's got its own governing law. The governing law could be the same as the governing law of the contract, or the governing law could be different. And whether it's the same or different uh, depends on what's stated in the uh, uh, arbitration clause itself. If the arbitration clause itself says this arbitration clause is governed by the laws of um, England and Wales, then uh, even if the, the contract has a governing law that says this uh, contract is governed by the laws of Singapore, the arbitration clause itself is not governed by the laws of Singapore, but it's governed by the laws of England and Wales. Now, if the arbitration clause is silent as to what uh, uh, its governing law is, then uh, that has to be sorted out by the courts or by the, the, the tribunal um, in determining, uh, in, in looking at various factors is there an implied choice? If there's no express choice, is there an implied choice of what the governing law is based on the circumstances, the connections uh, to the dispute, et cetera, et cetera? So that, that's, the, that's the short answer. I hope that was clear enough. Thank you. So, certainly. Thank you very much, Edmund. And, and if, 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 if you're still interested in the issue of this particular uh, matter of choice of law for the arbitration agreement, email me, uh, Zoom win. And I will, I will refer you to a seminar uh, I think given by someone at, uh, in Singapore uh, on this very issue, uh, taking into account some of the recent court decisions. So let, let's do it uh, separately. Um, right, the next question, we have two more left, so that we'll, we'll, we'll get squarely to 10 past um, four, so we're right on time, I hope. On result, there's one left. Um, in the case of an online arbitration, where the parties did not, this is on two Wang Chen, where the parties did not agree on the seat in the agreement, such arbitration is decentralized and conducted in cyberspace. Therefore, the seat of arbitration has yet to be determined. If even so, if the parties raise dispute against each other on the seat matter, on what grounds can the tribunal determine the seat of such online arbitration? Again, I think, as I was saying before, whether it's online or offline, it has got nothing to do with the seat. The seat discussion is a separate matter from the manner of the hearing. If the parties have not agreed on the seat, the tribunal will choose a seat for them based on the fact that we talked about since we started neutrality, uh, proximity, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And so, so that the tribunal will, based on those grounds, to choose a seat for the arbitration, whether it's online or not. Uh, you know, we, we've got to. I, I saw my co-speaker nodding, so I assume I've got, I haven't said anything out of line. Um, finally, uh, a question on translation. Well, this is most interesting. Wow, this is probably most challenging. Given the novelty of the concept, how do you put it into Vietnamese? Um, because the Vietnamese word, you simply say place of arbitration, and everyone understands that to mean the place of the hearing. Um, uh, so, what can we do about this? How can we make this clear in a Vietnamese language agreement? I assume I can comment on this. Um, oh, I don't know, maybe you can. Um, uh, uh, but I, 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 I mean, that the, I, I've got no magic insight. I'll, I'll turn a minute to Jiling and Ming. But I've, I, I, think, I think it doesn't matter what term we use in the end. We just have to, and the, 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 the closest one that I can think of now, but the more important thing is to give it a legal definition somewhere. This is the main thing. You can call it orange or apple or whatever. I mean, that doesn't really matter. But the main thing is you, you, you give it a label and then you define it somewhere in the law. You're know, written at the top of the law so everybody knows what you're talking about. Um, then that's the more important thing. And from that point on, then it becomes uh, uh, a legal concept. Uh, it doesn't matter what label you give it at the beginning. Uh, Ling or Ming, any, any comment on that? Um, uh, may I go first, Mr. Yes, yes. Oh, okay. Um, so I, I, I totally agree with you that it's, it's, it's not all about um, the term, it's not all about the terminology, which is the place of arbitration or in, this, in Vietnamese, or any other terms that you may use, but it's more about the legal concepts and also definition and interpretation of the law. Uh, as I said earlier, uh, there's no definition of the hearing venue in the law and commercial arbitration, which is 
such a pity that leaves uh, uh, a lot of uh, confusion. However, if you look at the consideration of, of the specific provision on the hearing venue in paragraph two of article 11 of law and commercial arbitration, which is uh, designated especially for the hearing venue, there you will see all the considerations that uh, the law has uh, provided uh, that the tribunal may take into account when decide the um, decide on the the hearing venue, which is the convenience uh, for for parties, for tribunal members, um, and other participants, as well as associated uh, expenses and and other uh, consideration that the tribunal thinks it fits, it, it's appropriate. So if you look at those um, implication and considerations, as well as the um, definition of place of arbitration in the law, you might have some idea uh, in order to, to distinguish between the two concepts. Uh, and in that way, you are not confused more about just, be just because of the terminology that is used in, in the agreement. Thank you. Thank you, Lee. Um, right, I think there's one left. So I'm let's try and deal with it before we, we, we wrap up. And, and this question, where I'm going to turn to, to Edmund. The question is about what jurisdictions in the world would be most supportive of online proceeding these days? I presume that all of the developed jurisdictions usually will see, you know, the usual suspects, Singapore, England, and so on. Uh, and I, I think there's been an Australian, not Austrian court decision somewhere uh, officially recognizing the effectiveness of online hearing by arbitrators. Um, but th th that's all I've got. Uh, Edmund, any more comments on this? Um, okay. Um, thanks, Rob. I, I'm not <laughs> a walking encyclopedia of which uh, jurisdictions um, allow or support online hearings and which don't. But guess what? There is a resource. Uh, look up the ICCA, I C C A report uh, on uh, virtual hearings. Um, I think uh, that should tell you which jurisdictions currently support virtual hearings and which uh, are neutral or which prohibit uh, virtual hearings. ICCA, ICA. Excellent. Thank you. Right. That, that has brought us to uh, the end of the, of the Q&A session uh, with, with a lot of questions from the audience. So I'd like to thank all the participants for a very, very helpful question. And of course, I'd like to thank my, my co-panelists for, uh, for your very valuable insight. Just to summarize everything, I think based on the question from um, Mr. or Mrs. Zoom Nguyen uh, about the need for a summary of the entire session, I think uh, point number one, I think as, as Mr. Cronenberg at, uh, at was saying earlier, that the, the point of way is you, you should specify that, actually, I think you must specify the seat. Don't forget to do that in the arbitration agreement because it in turn determines the nationality, nationality of the proceeding, meaning the choice of the procedural law that governs arbitration and the choice of the supervisory court. That's court jurisdiction over the proceeding. And these are extremely important. And there are other things that may flow on from there, but, but these are uh, very important things um, in the agreement. Governing law may be a separate issue and then there should be a separate seminar on that, on that matter, I think. So we'll not jump in that today. Um, so on that note, once again, I'd like to thank everybody for your uh, participation, especially our, our distinguished speaker for having spent your precious time uh, sharing your valuable experience with the, with the audience. And I'd like to thank the audience for your participation, uh, as well as your very um, insightful, interesting question. If by chance I have not been able to deal with any of the questions, I apologize. Uh, there might have been some technical glitch somewhere. Uh, but if that happens, please let us know. Let me know personally. I'm responsible for this personally. <laughs> so let me know, and, and I will make sure that the question is attended to one way or another. Uh, so thank you once again. And I will now give the floor back to Ms. Hung, the DIC Secretariat, to pose the proceeding. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much. It's it's a really busy afternoon uh, today for for all the the staff in in here uh, here at the app because we have received uh, over twenty uh, questions from the audience, from uh, Zoom, from uh, Facebook, and uh, YouTube channel of Yak. So we, we do. Uh, uh, happy, we are happy with that. Uh, since it is an English speaking event, and. Um, 
So thank you so much. I, I do think that the audience have, uh, and, and even myself have, um, have um, learned a lot uh, during the discussion. And as uh, all the speakers have just confirmed, the uh, seat of arbitration was so important, was so important that we have to pay attention a lot uh, when we're drafting the agreement, agreement in order to make sure that we will, uh, the agreement will produce the results that we expected. So um, uh, for, uh, at this moment, we still have over, uh, around 200 gases with us at this moment, and we do appreciate that. Um, so, um, so once again, uh, I would like to send a sincere thank you to all the speakers today. And uh, we would like to invite you to the fifth webinar uh, in, our web in our arbitration series uh, on the same day, same time frame uh, next week. Uh, or, and the topic will be uh, um, the interest in arbitration, uh, the ways that the legal provision on interest could be interpreted um, in, in the practice of arbitration in the court of Vietnam. And I do hope that uh, you will be enjoy uh, the next uh, webinar as you did today. Once again, thank you so much. And I'd like to uh, ask all the speakers will um, give it away to all the uh, our audience. Okay, so goodbye. Thank you and goodbye. Thank Bye. you, everybody. Thank you. 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 Thank you.